Hello, I'm Simon Smail. I'm a gastroenterologist in York. Welcome to More Than Just Medicine. I thought today it'd be uh, useful to uh, look at uh, some of our uh, understanding of uh, how uh, people get irritable bowel syndrome, what the causes are, uh, uh, and explain some of the complex interaction between what goes on in the gut and what goes on in the brain. Um, so people often ask me why have I got irritable bowel syndrome and the answer to that is often very complex and multifactorial so I thought the first thing I would do is explain how the nerves in the gut uh, normally work and how they normally interact with the brain although very often they don't actually normally interact with the brain very much because obviously um, when you're doing your normal things, your day-to-day -day job, looking after the kids, whatever, you're not really meant to be aware all that much about what you've had for lunch, about what you're digesting and what's going on in your gut. Actually, it only becomes an issue when those systems of communication between the brain and the gut go wrong. So to help me with this, I'm going to use a whiteboard, which I've got just next door here. I'm just going to turn my screen around and then you'll be able to see the whiteboard. So I've already drawn on here um, a picture of the brain, which is this chap over here, and the gut. So the great thing about um, the human body, and the, and the gut in particular, is the gut. And I've only drawn the large bowel here because otherwise it gets far too complicated. The gut is covered with a fantastic meshwork of nerve fibres that basically control and sense what's going on in the gut all the time. They uh, don't need any reference to your brain. In fact, there are more nerves in the gut than there are in the brain. That's because it's obviously a far more important organ. I would pin that thinking as a gastroenterologist. And there we go. So there's a fantastic, what are called neural networks or myenteric plexus sense what's going on in the gut all the time, tell the gut what to do next. Now, um, that goes all the way from about midway down your gullet, all the way to the anal verge, um, where the poo comes out. Now, um, so that's working all the time without you having to think about it. You don't have to think about your guts working. However, if you do occasionally, get a bit of debris or food in your gut, some of that may distend the bowel wall and you'll get a message going from the gut to your spinal cord. Okay, Now, that is normally relayed as a reflex back to the gut and uh, you're not really aware of it. It just happens. It's a little bit like uh, if somebody taps your knee and your patella tendon jerks away. Now, if you go out and you have a big meal, perhaps you have a birthday party or it's Christmas time, Christmas uh, work to do, you may get, you may go out and you may eat too much or you may drink too much or you may do other things which your gut doesn't like particularly and you get lots and lots of either distension or stimulation of your gut nervous system at various different points and then you get lots of messages going from the gut to the spinal cord. Okay. Now, at that point, some of those messages will go through our gateway in the spinal cord in an area called the dorsal horns and will go up to a bit of the brain that I usually in clinic call the messages from the gut centre. It's actually got a fancy Latin name called the anterior cingulate gyrus and there are some other associated areas with that as well. And that's where your gut messages go. That's where you get the sensation that um, you've eaten enough or that you feel sick or that you need to open your bowels. Now, uh, there's another bit of, of the brain that I'm, and it's not quite this simple, I'm rather simplifying it, that I'm going to call messages to the gut. Now, um, that has uh, a number of inputs. Not surprisingly, it's got inputs from messages from the gut. Okay. 
It's also influenced by the stresses that are going on in our lives. Uh, most of us recognise that if we're going to a strange place that we don't really uh, know, and we're feeling a bit nervous about it, lots of us get butterflies, lots of us get uh, perhaps a, a funny feeling in our tummy. Some people get diarrhoea, some people get constipation. That's normal. Quite where it becomes abnormal is a, is a spectrum. And um, so that influences the messages that go to the gut, as does, interestingly, how we were brought up around food. So if you were brought up that, you know, you, your family um, never uh, ate fish and your dad told you that he got sick when he got when you got fish or perhaps then you you may find that eating fish is something funny for you and you may not feel comfortable with it similarly if you were in your family and you were brought up never to open your bowels when you went uh, outside the home and some people uh, I, I have patients who who will not open their bowels um, when they're outside their own home then uh, those things influence the way we behave in respect of our guts as well. So that feeds in. But also, uh, personality and uh, and uh, the way we are, so the way we are as people. So all those things feed into the messages to the gut. And uh, emotional context, so that stress in this box here, plays a big part, not just the stress today but the stress in 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 the background as it were it may have happened in the past there's a big part in the messages that go to the gut it's not quite this simple there isn't actually just a box in the brain and that interestingly those things can have a big influence on whether this gate in the spinal cord is open and shut but also you can send messages directly to the gut so move faster move slow we're all aware we can ha have some control over our bowel movements now Effectively, what irritable bowel syndrome describes is the symptoms that people get when um, that complex system there goes wrong. And it can go wrong at a number of levels. It can go wrong if you have infection or inflammation within the gut. You can end up with these nerves firing at a lower threshold. And in fact, there are some very well-defined changes in the gut wall and the gut nerves that happen when people have infection and for most people they go back to normal after the infection gets better but not for people who get post-infective irritable bowel some of them may stay the same a chap called Professor Spiller has done some very interesting work in Nottingham around that equally there are some other people who have problems with the way that they filter these messages at uh, the level of the dorsal horns in the spinal cord and uh, those people uh, may send far more messages up to the brain than is normal. Equally, some people might send the messages to the wrong bit of the brain. That's interesting. If you send messages to a place, part of the brain called the amygdala, which is where you send all your really important messages, like the lion's going to eat you, or run now because the bus is going to run you over, then you cannot fail to ignore them. Your body, your mind, should I say, won't let you ignore those messages. And similarly, some people have a lot of stuff either going on in their past lives or going on in their current lives, which, which may act as a trigger. Equally, personality, we know that people who adapt and cope, so what we call, what the psychologists term adaptive copers, are particularly prone to developing irritable bowel although by no means does that include everybody that gets irritable bowel. Um, and so essentially what irritable bowel syndrome describes is a, is a collection of symptoms that people may get when this really complicated neural network and its communication with the brain goes wrong for one reason or another. And it's often multifactorial. So it's often a question of a bit of stress and somebody getting an infection. I hope that's of some help in helping uh, people's understanding of uh, irritable bowel syndrome and functional gut disease. Thanks for listening.